Good morning. Can you please join me in your Bibles in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 38. Matthew 5, 38. So we continue through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus continues to correct and to amplify the Jewish understanding of the law. And he is reaching the topic of retribution or retaliation. Every word of Jesus is more precious than gold. And every word of Jesus is of timeless relevance but at this particular moment in history, it's hard to imagine a more important subject for us to understand than how to respond to evil and what to do when we are wronged. And I don't think I'll be giving anything away by telling you now that the world's response to wrong is entirely wrong. So let's learn to do it right. Before we read the text, will you please pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we live in a time of sorrows, of disappointments, and doubts, and fears, and tears. And we ask that you would shine all the more brightly through the gloom of this life. May you answer us in the day of trouble. May you protect us, and help us, and support us. May your favor shine upon us. May our heart's desires be fulfilled in you. Lord, teach us not to repay evil for evil, insult for insult, threat for threat. Allow us to rest and rejoice in your salvation. You will save your anointed. You will answer with the saving might of your right hand. Let us not trust in chariots and horses. Let us not trust in intellect or wit or eloquence. Let us not trust in anything but the name of of the Lord our God. All else will collapse and fall. But you remain. And your kingdom and your years will have no end. May we ever be found in you when we pray. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So again, our text this morning, Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This is the word of our Lord. And Jesus again begins, as he has been in each successive section, by quoting the Pharisees as they quoted the Old Testament law and quoting the law accurately as far as it 
goes. This exact phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is found three times in the law. It's in Exodus 21, it's in Leviticus 24, and it's in Deuteronomy 19. This was part of the law of God. In Exodus 21, they're, they're dealing with a case of an inadvertent injury to an unborn child. It says that if two men are striving together, and, and in the course of their striving, they hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out. If there's no harm to the child, then the man who hit her will pay a fine as her husband imposes and as the judge determines. But if there is harm to the child then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Whatever cause, whatever injury you have caused to this unborn child, you will pay like for like. Leviticus 24 deals with personal injuries. It simply says if, if anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. And then in Deuteronomy 19, it deals with the issue of perjury with, with false witnesses. And I am I'm constantly stunned in our country about how little we care about <coughs> perjury. People appearing in a court of law, under oath, lying. And there are such mild and minor consequences for it. When, when the lie can have tremendous impacts on other people's lives. It's taken much more seriously in the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 19 says that if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judge shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Whatever the consequences of the lie would have been to the victim is to be inflicted upon a malicious false witness. This has become known as the law, the law of retribution. In, in Latin, it's the lex talonis, um, which makes it sound especially ominous and vicious. It's talon. And while it is unflinching and unpitying and hard, it, it is not vicious. It actually is a law that restrains violence and limits retribution to an equitable level. Consider all the way back in Genesis chapter 4, before the law is given, we meet Lamech, the grandson of Cain, great-grandson of Adam, fourth generation of, of mankind, and Lamech boasts to his wives, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Right, he, he wasn't inflicting punishment for punishment. He was avenging himself seventy-sevenfold. Whatever minor injury is done to Lamech, he's going to repay with severe injury. And that mindset of, of not just vengeance, but of multiplying vengeance has continued throughout history, even unto now. So much violence has been committed in the name of getting even, or more often of getting ahead. Violence between nations, violence between tribes, violence between gangs, violence between individuals, violence between families, uh, such as the, the Hatfields and McCoys, generations of feuding. Um, 
because of, of one wrong committed, so the other family felt like they needed to get even and inflict a greater injury, which received a greater injury in return for, for decades. Even as, as recently as, as 2008, then presidential candidate Obama made reference to the infamous Chicago way in vowing to fight against the, from his perspective, evils of the Republican Party. He, he promised that if they bring a knife to the fight, we'll bring a gun. He's quoting the untouchables, um, made famous by Sean Connery. The, the full quote, they pull a gun, you pull a knife. They send one of yours to the hospital, you send one of theirs to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. Violence, vengeance, escalation. That's the Chicago way. And, and that's the world's way. But it's, it's not God's way. God's way is justice and righteousness. The punishment is to fit the crime. Repayment or restitution or retribution is to equal the crime. Injury for injury. And no more. No cycles of increasing ongoing violence. No generational feuds. There's the transgression. There's the just and equal punishment for the transgression. And, and that's the end of it. And this judgment, this justice, was to be enacted by judges, by, by the judgment of the community under the authority of God's word. But men had appropriated it to a personal level. Instead of appealing to the judge and the judge investigating the case and imposing the penalty, men began to take their own vengeance. And, and they'd taken the limit... They'll pay eye for eye. If they cause you an injury and you lose one eye, then you're not going to be blinded in both eyes. You will lose one eye. They, they took that as the limit. and They made it the prescription. I must be equally avenged for every wrong done to me. Every evil inflicted upon me must be returned. It was, it was not God's way. It was man's way. It was certainly not the way of Christ. This, this law of retribution is an appropriate standard of justice for government. They, they do not bear the sword in vain. The punishment should fit the crime. But Christ calls his followers to a higher standard, to his own standard. And his standard, as he puts it, verse 39, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Do not resist the one who is evil. But understanding this standard has been a point of great difficulty in the Christian world. Uh, there, there have been some, not very many, but some, most notably a Leo Tolstoy, who were fully convinced that these words prohibit any sort of opposition to any sort of evil on any level. Tolstoy believed that Jesus taught not only an, an absolute personal pacifism, but an absolute condemnation of all wars, of all police, and even of all government. Because government exists to restrain evil. And well, if we shouldn't resist evil, then there should not be government. Others believe that Jesus is requiring an absolute personal pacifism and, and non-resistance while still allowing for a proper and God-ordained role for the government to restrain and punish evil. So, so you should never personally seek to defend yourself, but you can call the police and ask them to do it for you. Uh, still others live as though Jesus had never spoken these words at all. Or as if they didn't apply to us today. That we should and must defend ourselves tooth and nail against every evil that we experience. I don't believe that, that any of those understandings are correct. Likely, one or more of those understandings seem absolutely ridiculous and, and ludicrous to you. But we can't 
dismiss things just because they seem ridiculous. We, we just read in, in Proverbs, right? The man who trusts his own mind is a fool. God's words are the way of wisdom that we must walk in. So it doesn't matter how much we can fit Jesus' words into our pre-existing worldviews or how we can square them with our understanding of the world. What matters, the only thing that matters, is understanding what Scripture actually teaches because that is what God requires of us and that is how we want to live, however it might seem to our own minds. So what does it mean? What does Jesus mean when he tells us not to resist the one who is evil? We, we can understand by looking at the context, both the, the immediate context of the Sermon on the Mount and the wider context of Scripture. Jesus sets it in contrast with this law of retribution. Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And then he gives us four examples, and, and all four of those examples have to deal with personal interactions. He, he's not speaking about nations. He's not speaking about governments. He's not, and this is especially important, I think, he, he's not speaking, of, when he says the one, the one who is evil, he's, he's referring to a human doing evil to you. He's, he's not referring to Satan the evil one. A scripture twice directly commands us to resist the devil. In, in James 4 and in 1 Peter 5, James says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And, and 1 Peter warns us that to be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. So it's, it's not that there's not supposed to be any sort of resistance to Satan, to the forces of evil in the world. What Jesus is calling us to is to not resist with retribution or retaliation the people who do evil to us. So let's look at these four examples. First one, he says, again in verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. How do you not resist the one who is evil? By turning the other cheek. Then, as now, a, a slap in the face was demeaning and insulting. It, it stings and it startles and it expresses the, the contempt of the one striking the blow. The, the goal of a slap is to harm someone socially and emotionally far more than physically. It's an, it's an attack, an assault upon our, our dignity. And our immediate reaction is to respond in kind. Slap for slap, pain for pain, insult for insult. But Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek, to, to not retaliate, to humbly and gently endure the insults and the abuse. And this, this doesn't mean, and I think the King James Version has been unhelpful here, um, this doesn't mean that we can't take steps to protect ourselves from and others from serious bodily harm. The King James uh, translates the word as smite. If someone smites you on the cheek. And smite is not a word we use very often. But it, it, it is best translated as, as a slap or, or a rap, like a rap on the knuckles. Um, it's, it's an insult. It's, it's not an attempt by someone to, to kill you. Jesus... Peter and Paul all took action to escape from violent men seeking to harm them. But, but they never retaliated. They never repaid insult for insult or, or injury for injury. They, they didn't say, well, I'm going to get him back for that. Maybe I can't do it to his face, but just wait. There's going to be an opportunity. And I'm going to get him. That's, that's the attitude and the mindset that is 
that is contrary to the teachings of Jesus. Rather, as, as 1 Peter 2.23 remarks of Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. We, we can endure the insults and the abuse and trusting ourselves to God. Now, this also doesn't mean that we shouldn't be willing to protect others. Uh, Psalm 82, verse 4, commands us to rescue the weak and the needy, to deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So we should do all we can to prevent violence and protect others and ourselves. But we should never seek vengeance. We, we should never seek to get even. We should never seek to repay evil for evil. It's very, very instructive in, in the Old Testament law, um, also in Deuteronomy. If a thief breaks into your home and you strike him and he dies, there's no guilt upon you. But if the sun has risen, and you strike him, then you're guilty for his, his blood. So while he's in the act of robbing your home, you, you can defend yourself and your property. But once he's gotten away, even if you know who it was, right, you, you can report him to, to the judge and, and bring him before the judge, but you can't just go and kill him and reclaim your, your property. That's, we, we can't say, well, I know who did this to me. I'm going to get back at it. You can defend yourself, you can defend others, but you cannot avenge yourself. Vengeance belongs to God alone. The second example, in verse 40, And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. The Jews dressed in two layers of Clothing. They had a, a softer inner tunic against the skin, and then they'd have a, a thicker and heavier and warmer and probably scratchier cloak. The, the law in Exodus 22, 26 forbade you from taking your neighbor's cloak. If your neighbor gave you his cloak and pledge, whether it's security for a loan or, or repayment of a debt, you were required, you could take it from him. But before the sun set, you had to give it back to him. Because what else is he supposed to sleep in? They, they did not have blankets and hot water bottles and all these other things. We have um, furnaces and hot air blows to stay warm at night. They had their cloak. They slept in their clothes. So it was crucial for them to be able to sleep. And so you were forbidden for taking someone's cloak. Now, both tunics and cloaks were expensive. The vast majority of people would own one cloak and one or maybe two tunics. And if someone had a legitimate claim against you in court and, and you couldn't repay them with money, then the court could require you to pay with your tunic. But they could not take your cloak from you. It's kind of like how in, in modern bankruptcy, Filings. Um, I, when I lived in Louisville, I, I worked at a very expensive condominium, and one of the people who lived—I mean, these are you know, multi-million-dollar condos. Um, one of the people who lived there um, was a former exec for um, Thornton Gasoline. He'd filed for bankruptcy several times, and still lived in this multi-million-dollar. Not all, less than $2 million. Very expensive condo because when you file for bankruptcy, they can't take your house. You, you can be forced to liquidate other assets to pay your debt, but they can't take your house. Um, in the ancient world, that your cloak was like that. You say, okay, you, you have to sell your animals to pay the debt, you, you have to turn over your tunic to pay the debt, but they can't take your cloak from you. That's your, your shelter. In the night. 
no, no matter how much in the wrong you were and how short you were of repaying your debt, you could still cling to your, your cloak. But Jesus calls us to be willing to sacrifice even our cloak rather than to leave the debt unfulfilled and our neighbor at odds with us. It, it's better to give up your cloak, to give up things you have a right to, than to cause offense. If someone has a rightful claim against us, we should be willing to offer more than they are entitled to as we seek to restore the relationship. We should not be bitter or resentful over what we owe. Just as we shouldn't use the law of retribution to say that, well, I've been wronged, so I'm going to inflict the exact same punishment on you, we, we also shouldn't use the law of retribution to say that, well, I've, yes, I have wronged you, but I'm only going to repay you to this very minimum limit that I can get away with. And you better be satisfied with that. We're, we're called to go above and beyond to restore, to right the wrong we've committed, to restore the relationship that we've harmed. So we should demand less of others. We should also offer more of ourselves. Then the third example is in verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. This is probably the most contrary to our, our modern uh, way of life. But Roman law gave a soldier a right to force a civilian to carry his supplies for one mile and, and no further. I mean, they could do it because they had the weapons. But the law said you can force a civilian to carry your baggage for one mile. Then he has to stop. You have to let him stop and put your bags down. He can walk back home. And you can find someone else to carry your bags for the next mile. It was a great help to the soldier. It was a great hardship for the civilian who, who not only was forced to leave whatever he was working on in the day and take up this heavy burden and walk with it a mile. And then while the soldier is looking for someone else, he has to walk a mile back. So it, it's close to an hour of his work day uh, that's lost because the soldier doesn't want to carry his own bags. It was insulting, it was, it was degrading. And it served only to benefit the invaders who had conquered their nation. Right? These weren't our soldiers protecting us. This was the occupying Roman army. But Jesus says that we should bear such a burden willingly, going even beyond what is required of us. And there's... There's so many burdens set upon us by the government, by others. There's taxes upon taxes upon taxes that we have to pay. There's processes and procedures and guidelines and ordinances that seem to serve no purpose except to make our lives more difficult and to put more money in, in the pockets of the government and of their friends. And it's very easy to grumble about such laws and ordinances. And we are allowed and we should seek to change those laws. But until they are changed, we're called to submit to such things will, willingly and even cheerfully. Now let, let me quote Martin Lloyd-Jones on this topic. He says, If we become excited about these matters, or lose our temper about them, if we are always talking about them, and if they interfere with our loyalty to Christ or our devotion to Him, if these things are monopolizing the center of our lives, we are living the Christian life, to put it mildly, at the very lowest level. No, says our Lord, if you are doing that job, and this soldier comes along and says you have to carry his baggage for a mile, not only do it cheerfully, but go the second mile. The result will be that when you arrive, the soldier will say, who is this person? What is it about him that makes him act like this? He's doing it cheerfully and is going beyond his duty. And they will be driven to this conclusion. This man is different. He seems to be unconcerned about his own interests. As Christians, our state of mind and spiritual condition should be 
such that no power can insult us. It is an inconvenience. It, it is an insult to be forced to carry this Roman's baggage for a mile. But by the grace of Christ and, and by the power of Christ, we can and we should be willing to accept such inconveniences, to go beyond even what is required of us. Because we have something better than our own interests to look for. And then the fourth example, verse 42. How do we not resist the one who's evil? By giving to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So here we have the issue of someone who's asking you for food or money or your clothing. And he has no rightful claim on it. He, he can't take you to court and say that, well, I did this work and he didn't pay me. Or I lent him this money and he didn't pay it back. It's, it's simple begging. You haven't wronged him. You don't owe him anything. Whatever you have, and he's asking for stuff that you've worked for, and that you've saved and sacrificed to keep. And it, it's our temptation to say that, well, he should have worked harder. He should have made better decisions. If he hadn't wasted his money, then he wouldn't be in this position of needing to ask for what I have. And, and you're very probably right. But Jesus tells us to give anyway. We shouldn't cling to our own property and our rights and our prerogatives and our interests. We should give and, and lend to those in need. Now, there, there is a limit to this. Um, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, we're commanded, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. There, there are people who desire to work, and are unable to work. Or, or people who work as hard as they can and, and due to circumstances are still unable to, to support themselves and their, their families. Uh, those people we should give as they ask of us. There's, there's others who could work but prefer to walk in idleness. And scripture says let them not eat. I, I would encourage you with, with such people to offer them a job instead. Um, let, let them come and mow your lawn and give them, depending on you guys have a very big lawn, but pay, pay, them, pay them fairly, pay them generously for doing that work. But make them, let them work for that rather than, than just supporting their sinful idleness. But the, the underlying concern is we shouldn't be looking for, well, how can I possibly get out of giving them anything because I want to keep what I have? It should be, how can I help? How can I serve? How can I demonstrate the love of Christ for these people? The, the principle in all these examples is the same. We're to deny ourselves to not insist upon our own rights and privileges over anyone else's, but to consider others more significant than ourselves. We, we don't resist the evil one. When, when we're wronged, we should prefer to endure the wrong rather than to get even. When we are in the wrong, we should be eager to make things right. When our self-interest runs into someone else's, then we should be just as concerned, more concerned for their interest than for our own. We, we should not insist on this absolute unyielding justice of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Rather, we should exercise mercy. And this is impossible in ourselves. It's contrary to human nature. But it is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's possible through the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus asks nothing of us that he hasn't first given to us. 
And he asks nothing of us that he has not done himself. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, it, it was a far worse transgression than a slap on God's cheek, although far more futile as well. It was a rejection and a rebellion against all that was good and right and true in the universe. A rebellion that we have all joined in. And it would have been just for God to respond by instantly and utterly destroying Adam and Eve and all their children forever. And yet God's patience waits thousands of years of passing over sins and, and punishing always more lightly than our sins deserve. And he doesn't just give us another opportunity to get it right. He doesn't say, well, the first one's free, and I'll give you one more chance. Human history and your own personal history demonstrates convincingly that you will never get it right on your own. But the Father sent His Son into the world to reconcile us to Himself. When the world rejected and crucified the righteous one, He not only went willingly to die on the cross, but He gave far more of Himself than, than all the courts and all the mobs and all the kingdoms in the world could ever have demanded. He bore not only the nails and the thorns and the spear and the cross, but He bore the weight of the sins of all who would ever believe in Him. And He rose from the grave not only to vindicate His own righteousness, but to secure eternal life for all those who would be united to Him through faith. No one can demand another man's cloak and pledge, but all who come to Jesus in faith will be covered with a cloak of His righteousness and made safe and secure forever. And He walks with us not just one mile, not just two miles, but forever. He's promised His church that He will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And this age will only end when Jesus returns to gather us to Himself so that where He is, there we might be also throughout all eternity, world without end. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is always with us, always leading us, always comforting us, always protecting us, always providing for us, always interceding for us. You, you can't run from His presence. And you can always receive His grace because He gives generously to those who ask of Him. I once met a man in, in St. Louis who, I don't know what he was thinking or what I looked like, but he walked up and asked, can I have a thousand dollars? And I had to respond that I, I don't have a thousand dollars at that time in my life. I didn't have a thousand dollars in my bank account. Um, I had just started working. Um, but I offered to buy him lunch. That, that was all. He didn't want lunch. He just wanted a thousand dollars. That was all I could do. But Jesus has riches far beyond all that we can ask for. And the only thing that keeps us from those riches is our refusal to ask for them. Luke 11.13 promises that the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. And it's... There's, there's this danger of growing up and attending a, a Reformed church we rightly understand that regeneration is a work of the Holy Spirit. And that the dangers, I think, well, okay, so I don't have to do anything. I just sit here 
and wait until the Holy Spirit regenerates me. Ask God for the Holy Spirit. Ask God to regenerate your heart. He promises to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Romans 8.32 promises that, that just as God gave up His Son for all, He will also with Him graciously grant us all things. Or Philippians 4.19, My God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Christ is yours and all things are yours. All the riches of God, more than, than everything in this world, He'll give you everything you need if you'll only ask Him. He will give you forgiveness for your sins, regeneration through the Holy Spirit, eternal life with Jesus Christ, victory over sin, and everything necessary for life and godliness. Everything you could ever rightly want. You have only to ask and to accept what God has given through His Son. So how can we not resist the one who is evil? It's by entrusting ourselves to the grace of God, allowing Him to take vengeance, and concerning ourselves only with doing good and walking in obedience to Christ's word. Let's accept the grace of our awesome God. And let's live by His Word. Will you pray with me? Our Father, thank You for Your Son. He who is the great shepherd of the flock. He who is enthroned above the cherubim. We ask that you would shine forth. We ask that you would stir up your might and come and save us. Let your face shine that we may be saved. We have sought to avenge ourselves. We have sought to cling to what we think is rightfully ours. We've sought to depend upon our own strength. Lord, teach us to let go of such things. Oh, we, we are your people. You are our shepherd. You will protect us from the ravenous wolves. You will protect us from cruel men. You will protect us from the devil's lies. You will protect us from the temptations of this world. Let us hear your voice. Let us draw near to you. Let us enjoy the love and the comfort, the safety of your presence this day and every day. And we trust your wisdom and not our own. And we know the joy of your salvation. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.